when someone says, well, that was obvious, anyone could have done that, what's your response? They didn't. <laughs> well, I'm the founder of the company. I founded it about 14 years ago. I'm a theoretical physicist, but also an inventor. I have 114 patents. And I am chief scientist of the company. You know, I'm really a serial entrepreneur. Although I took my PhD in theoretical physics, I'm a very practical guy, and I've always thought of ways to apply it. So I started my first company here in San Diego called Spin Physics, built it up to about 650 people, ran it for 15 years, and sold it to Eastman Kodak. Then I started another company I sold to 3M, then I started another company I sold to Seagate, and then I invented the engine, the uh, improvement on the engine that Hugo Junkers invented in 1890. This engine set a record in 1936 when they were running mail flights from Germany, Dessau, Germany to South America, 6,000 miles unrefueled. It had an efficiency that exceeded any engine that had ever been made before. During the war they did uh, bombers, hundreds of bombers, diesel powered. They did reconnaissance aircraft that went to 52,000 feet diesel powered. And then at the end of the war, the jet engine came along, jet fuel was very cheap, so there was no incentive to work on it further. So it lay fallow for 70 years. When I discovered it, I went on vacation in Mexico and took along a book on the theory and practice of internal combustion, a little light reading, and discovered the engine that set a record in 36 and never been broken. But it was clear when I discovered this engine, that it would be possible by using modern techniques like computational fluid dynamics to improve the performance of the engine well beyond what was possible when it was first developed. So around 2001, I uh, discovered the engine. And at that time, I had a very close friend, John Walton. But we met in, through flying down in Mexico. I, I landed at a remote airport somewhere on a dirt road and he was, his airplane was there, and we became close friends. And he wanted to invest in, he offered to invest in the company, and I told him I don't invest with friends. But after we get the risk out of it, I'd be glad to uh, talk to him. And one day he called up and said, I want to come down and convince you you should invest with me. And he had a very compelling argument. He said, I don't care how good your intellectual property is, this thing is so big, you could be bled to death through litigation, spurious lawsuits. You need a deep pocket. And he described a company he had where they had deep intellectual property. They found a major European, a Japanese company was infringing their patents. They brought it to the attention of the company and they said, okay, well, we've got a $10 million war chest. How far would you like to take it? They said, maybe we better tell you who we are. <laughs> John had a net worth of about 20 billion at the time. So it was a pretty compelling argument. So we formed this partnership. And two days before we fired the engine for the first time, he was killed in an aircraft accident. I remember when I was a kid, fuel used to be, what, seven cents a gallon, something like that. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But with the the shortage of fuel, we're going to have to pay attention to uh, efficiency. Remember now, this is about a $350 billion a year engine industry. Now, all of the big manufacturers, certainly the truck manufacturers, all have diesels. And they're all four-stroke. A four-stroke engine has a valve train, has uh, valves, valve seats, camshafts. 80% of the parts of the engine are associated with the valves. Well, the opposed piston, two-stroke engine has no valves, no valve gear, no valve train, and no cylinder head. So automatically, it's higher efficiency. It has twice the stroke to bore ratio without increased piston speed because it's shared between two pistons. So it has all of the ingredients for making a more efficient engine. It was a hangover of two-stroke horror stories 
that had prejudiced the knee-jerk reaction of many people. Two-stroke, no, you can't, you can't make it clean, you can't, uh, you can't make it efficient. We found through computational fluid dynamics that when the two pistons come close together, by shaping the contour of each piston to complement each other, we could create a combustion pseudo volume that would be very efficient in mixing the air and fuel. And that was part of the solution to increasing the efficiency. Many engines have a sweet spot where they get the maximum efficiency. If you're off that, the efficiency falls off very rapidly. Ours is a very flat prop, uh, plot that is uh, efficient, about the same efficiency everywhere. Any application of diesel at present time uh, will benefit from this configuration, two-stroke, by better efficiency and cleaner performance. As an example, we know of one retail outlet that has 7,200 trucks. Their fuel bill last year, just for those trucks, was 350 million. We can save them 70 to 100 million dollars a year just by converting to this engine. But it not only was efficiency important, but we had to meet the emission standards, and we have done that. Ours is the cleanest engine, about 20 to 30 percent more efficient than any diesel ever made. Well, there are many people who just will not accept without hard dynamometer evidence that that's possible. It's foreign to their, all of their experiences. So what convinces people is really hard data from the dynamometer. And they, uh, they come here and they see it and they say, wow, we wouldn't have believed it. A lot of people think of entrepreneurialism as high risk. And I take just the opposite view. It's really the opportunity to do it your way. If you're in a large corporation, you don't have the freedom to do it your way. So if you want to do it your way, go out and do it yourself. So it's freedom. That's what entrepreneurialism is about, not risk-taking.